This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. What's going on, Bible nerds? We're talking about Jesus is the Good Shepherd, so let's take a closer look. Let's do it. These metaphors sometimes are hard for me because um, the ancient world is so different than our world. Yeah. Um, like, I, I got to be honest, I... I don't know anything about being a shepherd. Mm. Like that's not a metaphor I really have. I know they take care of sheep. I know a few stories about how they would do that. But like, as far as me putting my eyes on somebody being a sheep herder, or a shepherd, I don't really have much of a construct for that. Right. So you got to think about what constructs do you have? that are yeah. similar uh, cattle. I got a concept for that one. Right. Uh, just because of where we grew up. But and it's only in that con in that construct of the metaphor that I understand what Jesus says about a gate, mm. which is what the whole conversation in John 10 is actually set up by, is that there's sheep, a shepherd, a gate, and a gatekeeper. And these four elements are there, and there's an honest way to do things, there's an honest way to do business, and there's a, a terrible way to do business. That's the setup of the first like five verses of John 10. Mm. That whole idea of like, I'm the gate, I'm the gate, like I'm here. Anybody that's come before me is a bandit. They're not doing it right. It's This is not good business construct, right? This right. is not a good structure of business. This is not how you do it. <laughs> and you get this weird thing at the end of verse six or six, Jesus used this figure of speech with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Like, once again, it's the whole parable thing, right? Right. But that's what he's doing. He's setting it up, saying, like, there's an honest way to do things and a dishonest way to do things. And as much as he's trying to reveal in that moment. So then they come back, and they're like, they, we don't understand. So then he says, so again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, all who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. So let me ask you a question. In any narrative like that where there's sheep and you have a person who owns the sheep, an honest kind of person that does business a certain way or bandits and thieves. Who do you want to be? You want to be gate and you want to be the person that's doing it right. Yeah. Correct. I mean, they have more, right? right. Cause they own all of them. You may steal a few. So Jesus has clearly put himself in the superior position in the story. Right. I mean, he just jumps right out there, and he's the best that there is to offer. But when he says, all who came before me were bandits or thieves, who do you, what kind of people do you think he's talking about? Well, so there's a few different places in my mind goes, but none of them seem like the right answer. Um, because the people that would have come before him would have been the prophets, you know, but they're not the thieves that he's talking about it, that it seems th that my mind makes up. You know what I mean? False messiahs. Okay. People that come about offering salvation. Those were rampant in the ancient world. Okay, we don't have a bunch of stories of them in the in the in the New Testament, mm. but in extra canonical writings of the same period, there's messiahs left and right. Mm. There, there's a ton of them. They're all around the culture. Well, I mean, it makes sense that if that is the whole prophecy deal, mm -hmm. um, that people would try to make themselves the messiah. Yep. So there's a ton of false messiahs throughout the world. 
And the reason that's important that he's given you that construct is because he's about to announce himself as Messiah. Mm. But you would miss that. And that's a huge piece of the narrative, right? You don't have to even bring up thieves and bandits in that. If you want to tell just the way of salvation, which is what's coming, you can do that without the thieves and bandits. Right. But Jesus wants to introduce them in the story because he wants you to know that he's announcing himself as Messiah. Mm. The narrative is telling you that's what's happening right now. Okay. And they came before the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Now, this is interesting. Jesus announces himself as two pieces of the story. Because here in a minute, he's going to announce himself as the good shepherd. But right now, he's the gate. Why is it important that Jesus is the gate? Well, that goes back to uh, John 3. Um, no, John 4, I'm sorry, that you can't get to the Father any other way than him. Okay, yes. So, by Jesus being the gate, what does it allow God the Father to play in the story? It allows God to be the telos, the end goal, right? No, no, no. In the story of the characters you have, it allows God to be the gatekeeper, okay. the one who opens and closes the gate. So Jesus still gets the way, right? Because he still controls the flow, who can get in and out. But by Jesus taking on the role of the gate, it allows God the Father to play the role of the gatekeeper, which is important because we're not going to come back to this metaphor as we go through and Jesus explains this. Okay. And then you have the sheep. So who are the sheep? It's obviously us. us. Okay. So Jesus says in verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. So there are two things here. The metaphor of going in and coming out. What, what, how should you read that in the story? I have no idea. Okay. So I'm asking these questions because I want our listeners to try to begin to break down the fullness of these stories right. as they're reading them because they're, they're very powerful stories and you can get a lot out of them if you really read them. You're just honestly saying things like you'll ask me a question yeah. and I, I, I answer and like it, what the answer you're looking for is not what I give. And so like at this point I have no idea. <laughs> gotcha. So, so the value, the value in coming and going is freedom. Okay. It's so, liberty. It's liberation. So that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's literally liberation. But when it says, and this is where I say, they can come in and go out and find pasture. Right. When you when you turn something out to pasture, there's a time where you turn it out to pasture and it's the last time they go out. Right. Because you don't put them in rotation anymore. You don't do anything. They're just there to live out the rest of their life. That's tell us. That's the end. Notice, where is telos? Peace. Yeah, peace on earth. Yeah. It's here, it's present, it's earthly. Nothing about this narrative is telling you that salvation is floating away. Mm. Nothing about this narrative is any kind of escapism or, or anything of that nature. This is all a very present and real experience of the kingdom of God as Jesus is telling this story, even to the fact that he's bought, he's brought down God, the father to be the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. Everything is a very localized experience of the kingdom. Okay. So turn it out to pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life, and have it abundantly. So obviously you've heard the enemy, the thief, 
right. steal, kill, and destroy. That's mm-hmm. a very common idea of talking about the cosmic enemy right. of God. The thing that I think is interesting is that if you steal, if you kill, and you destroy, I don't, I don't really know how to ask what I want to ask, but if, if you're a person that embodies that type of action, that type of activity, what does that say about your person? How do you carry yourself in, in that way? Like, like in the act itself? Or just, just as a per, a, the type of person that does that, how would you categorize them and their life, their choices? Fundamentally, you would generally categorize it as evil. As evil. So when we talk about evil, we talk about good versus evil. Right. When Jesus sets it up, how does he combat it? He doesn't say, I'm good. Not yet. Not immediately. He says, they came to steal, kill, and destroy. I came to offer life. Jesus personifies death. All of the brokenness in the world. And this is really important because in John 3, Jesus says, for God so loved the world, right? right? World there is encompassing of sin. By putting these three categories of steal, kill, and destroy, and then comparing them to life, Jesus has personified death. All of these now get classified as death because he's contrasting it with life. That's important as the story builds because all of life becomes death. All of your experience becomes death, which is important because the thing we're going to talk about next week is resurrection. Right. When Jesus resurrects, he conquers death. Right. And therefore conquers all of the pain and trauma that you see in the world. Yeah. You see how this is happening? Yeah. Okay. And then he says, so in saying I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I I really don't have a way to explain to you what that means. Right. In Greek, um, other than the image of like a four-year-old kid and their dad. Like when I talk to Ezra, sometimes I will tell her like, Hey Ezra, I love you. And she'll say, I love you more. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I love you 100. And she'll say, well, I love you 200. And then I just try to win. And I say, well, I love you infinity. Like I'm going to try to come up with some kind of construct that you can't outnumber. Right. That's life and life abundant. Mm. Um, Life and life abundant is not, something that's haphazard. It's not like I love you to the moon and back. It's a construct that's undefinable. I, as you, as the enemy has all of death, I want all of life. If all of your being is encapsulated by death, when you come through and you are saved, I want all of your being to be encapsulated in life. Mm. I want the wholeness of your person living in an experience of life at every turn of your humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a full encapsulation of new life, new Mm. birth, new experiences of reality. It's a radical change. So it's so crazy because I've never thought about it that deep. You know, I've, I've heard this text preached countless times. Um, and, the life and life abundantly thing I've never heard fleshed out that way. Um, and so that, that actually does kind of change your perspective on this. Well, and that's why it was so important for me to set up the personification of death thing is because, I mean, like at times you might think that's superfluous, Mm. but like walking those three categories out, those are not death. Stealing is not death. Right. But Jesus puts all of that in contrast to life, which then makes all of that death. 
Which makes the whole f- deal that Paul is trying, the, the argument that Paul's trying to make that sin does equal death. Correct. Um, and therefore, anything that does not participate in godness is sin and death. Correct. Correct. So now you've got this construct, okay? You've got this idea that Jesus has set you up with. And now you're on the fence, right? Now you're like, you're holding the edge of your seat because yeah. you want to know what happens next. Jesus hits you with this statement. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Remember how last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, in the story where Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, Mm -hmm. and I talked about this trauma, that the imagery is trauma. And then last week we talked about the light of the world Mm -hmm. and how darkness and evil things happen in the dark. You're going to see this pattern of experiences of trauma yielding life. This is another one of those moments. Mm. The good shepherd, in order to be good, according to Jesus, must die. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay, I, I'm tracking now. Um, okay. Keep Life going. continually is experienced throughout the Gospel of John only in contrast to the death that's seen in the world. Time and time and time again, Jesus sets it up. This thing you know as the world is not life. You call it life, but it's not life. I have an experience of life for you, waiting for you, that is far greater than anything you could have ever seen or imagined on your own. But you can't see it Mm. because of the pain and trauma. And that's why you're sheep. And, and this, is, this is not derogatory to anyone because Jesus calls us all sheep. But sheep may be the dumbest creatures on the planet. Yeah. I mean, they literally just stand around. Well, and, and so what I was thinking about in that moment is that the reason we are sheep, no one would die for, for their For sheep. Animal. No one on this planet would die for sheep. No, I but, well, I mean, maybe if you really maybe. loved a sheep. Yeah, but. maybe, but like, as a form of like income, no one's gonna die for that. No one's gonna lose their life. Well, they're for that. not valuable enough. Yeah, I mean, sheep are just not a valuable animal, as far as you know, purchasing of animals go. Yeah, they may be valuable be, to but. someone's life, right? So in that way, but. The whole point here is that if I'm the shepherd and I hire you to come take care of my sheep for a minimum wage, you're not dying to take care of my sheep. Your life's not worth $8 an hour. No. Right? Your life's worth much more than that. But the shepherd... It's his livelihood. It's everything. Well, no. I actually think that that's, that's where we're different. I actually think what Jesus is saying here is what you said earlier. Nobody's laying down their life for sheep. Except me. Unless you loved uh, your sheep. Oh, I see. Nobody's doing it out of a monetary or selfish like situation. Sheep aren't worth that much. It comes down to agape. It's love. It's that it's out of love. And so... The, the kind of end cap, the bookend to Jesus' story here and the power moment is not just that I've come to offer life and life abundant. And I'm going to do that by you understanding that I've got to die in order to offer you life. 
this death that you experience in the world, I've got to take that from you so that you might be able to have life and life abundant. But on top of that, the bookend is that, hey, I do all of this because I love you. I do all of this because you're mine, because I know you, because the Father knows me and I know you, and I do nothing except what the Father wills, and we love you. Mm. And so I put myself in a position where I'm going to offer my own life. Notice, same metaphor. My life, the Son of God, my person, the pre existent Son of God who has never experienced death. I'm going to take death so that I can offer you life. And I do all of it because I want you to know you're loved. Mm. I want you to know that I love you and my father loves you. And so I give up my life so that you may have life.